Welcome everyone to our Talent and Learning Next Practices monthly series call. Great to have you with us. Uh, keep the chat open. Those of you that have already been introducing yourself over there in the chat, uh, love to have uh, uh, so many returning faces, so many names that we recognize from previous calls, whether it's this series or the Getting Harvard Work Right series, which we alternate with these ones every other Thursday. Uh, if you're new to this call series or new to any of our calls, uh, we are the Institute for Corporate Productivity, I4CP. Uh, we're a human capital research firm that discovers the people practices of high performance organizations. Uh, what we do when we do our surveys is we ask questions on a particular topic in human capital, human resources, um, and then we look at what the high performing organizations do versus low performers. Uh, we define high performance, as you see there on the screen, revenue growth, revenue growth, market share, profitability, and customer satisfaction. And we can then correlate what that top quartile of organizations are doing more often than the bottom quartile. And that really allows us to tease out best and, and next practices uh, from our research. We are a member-based organization here at I4CP. Here's just a small sample of our hundreds of, of member companies. Uh, you see a wide range of industries, uh, organization size. Um, maybe some of your organizations are here. If you're with us today uh, from a member organization, a uh, super special welcome to you. Always love to see uh, as many members as possible joining us on these calls. My name is Tom Stone. I'm a senior research analyst here at I4CP, and I always have the pleasure of co-hosting these talent and learning calls with our CEO and co-founder, Kevin Oakes. Hi, Kevin. Oh, Tom, the pleasure is all mine. So uh, hi, good to see you again this morning. Yeah, good to be with you. And as folks are still joining, welcome. Uh, please keep the chat open. And we'll be using that throughout the call today. You'll be able to ask questions of myself and Kevin, as well as our special guest, who we'll be introducing in just a moment. I uh, want to give a few other reminders and announcements, though. Uh, this is just one in an ongoing series of, of Thursday calls that we host open to the public. You'll see coming up next week on the 15th, we'll have Russell Robinson from the Department of HHS joining us for our next version of Getting Hybrid Work Right. Um, then we'll be focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion um, with a leader from Allstate. Um, we also, though, do some in-person uh, gatherings, so I wanted to highlight one that's coming up. Uh, at I4CP, we have a, a series of boards. These are for high-level uh, individuals like chief learning officers, chief diversity officers, uh, CHROs, um, that are members of the I4CP board groups. Uh, they meet virtually throughout the year, um, but they also meet twice a year uh, in person. And one of those meetings is always in the fall, usually hosted at one of the member uh, headquarter locations. Uh, and of relevance for this group today, our talent and learning uh, group, the Chief Learning and Talent Officer Board, uh, is going to be meeting next week out in Mountain View in the Bay Area hosted by Humaira Shahid from Intuit. So Kevin and I are looking forward to being part of that uh, that meeting next week. Yep, it'll be good to see Humaira, who's been a great participant in, the, in that board as well. Another member of that board is Brenda Suguru, who you see here. She's the Chief Learning Officer at EY, and she's going to be joining Kevin for a special version of our Getting Hybrid Work Right call coming up on September 29th. Kevin, you want to say a little bit more about that? Yeah, I'm thrilled Brenda can join us. Brenda's a longtime friend, been at EY as the CLO for a number of years. She's also the member chair of our Chief Learning and Talent Officer Board. And what she and I are going to talk about is how, how learning cultures really um, epitomize high-performing organizations. And in most of our research, when we go in and look at companies that are just really thriving and doing well, they typically have a culture of learning. So we want to look at, uh, at that a little more deeply. Um, and for companies who are trying to create a culture of learning, how do you do it? How do you get that started? Yeah, so once again, that will be open to all of you. That's part of our Getting Hybrid Work Right series uh, with a focus on learning that time. That'll be September 29th. If you're registered for this series, the Next Practices monthly series, but aren't registered for Getting Hybrid Work Right, it is a separate registration, um, but it's at the same time. It's on alternating Thursdays at 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific. So I'd recommend... Uh, if you're interested in hybrid work and all the interesting different facets of it, including learning, uh, you might want to register for that series as well. As I mentioned with our board meeting, uh, we do host in-person events. Of course, we weren't able to for 
about 18 months or a couple of years during the pandemic, um, but we're super excited uh, that, you know, this past March, we were able to gather again in Scottsdale, Arizona for our big Next Practices Now conference after taking a couple of years off from being in person. Um, we are just now, I believe this, as of this morning, announcing uh, some of the speakers for the upcoming event uh, this March. Uh, Kevin, once again, do you want to speak to a couple of the names and faces you see here? Yeah, I mean, these are just some of the speakers that we'll have in March uh, in Scottsdale. We're missing uh, Joe Whittinghill from Microsoft. Joe will also be uh, on stage with us. Uh, but we're thrilled with the lineup that we've got. Um, really some great uh, thought leaders, authors, as well as senior HR executives that are going to join us as usual at Next Practices Now. Uh, this conference has been rated the number one conference for HR execs. Uh, primarily because it's a true conference. There's no trade show. We, we actually don't allow uh, consultants or vendors at the conference. So it's just practitioners uh, interacting with each other. So I'm really looking forward to it. It's always a, a highlight of the year for us at I4CP. Yeah, absolutely. I've been to it a few times since I've been with the company now for five years, and, and it's truly a great event. And as you see the location there at the bottom, um, just because uh, we'll be gathering in Scottsdale doesn't mean we won't also have a virtual attendance component. So if you haven't registered yet, if you think you might be interested, uh, go over. Uh, Zeta has put the link already in the chat. Um, you can check out the lineup of speakers in more detail and, and register for the either the in-person or the virtual options. All right, we have one poll that we'd like to ask everyone. We asked this uh, on some other recent calls, and then we're going to get to our special guest today. This is a culture-related question. Has your organization's culture changed since the onset of the pandemic? Um, yes, and in, in it's become better, maybe somewhat better. Yes, it's deteriorated or become much worse. Um, or no, it's essentially uh, sort of at the same level. Obviously, it's possible that, that the culture has uh, changed but hasn't really gotten better or worse. We're just focusing on that better or worse uh, aspect of, of change here. So if you don't mind answering this poll question, um, give folks another couple seconds and then we'll uh, close the poll and we'll introduce our guest and, and maybe get some conversation going about hey, this Tom, and this, many uh, other topics. Tom, this poll is a good precursor to a new study that we've got coming out on organizational culture. So look for that in the next uh, uh, couple of weeks. We're gonna be looking at not only how has culture changed during the pandemic, um, but also exploring some elements of culture such as toxicity and how are companies dealing with pockets of it inside their organization and generally how are companies creating healthier cultures overall. That's right. Um, so look forward to that coming soon. We'll want as many organizations to participate in that survey as possible. And as you see here from the results, Kevin, we're seeing pretty similar to what we've had on other recent calls where uh, more companies saying, yes, it's improved at least somewhat. Um, a good number of companies, though, saying it's deteriorated somewhat. Uh, no one on this call, at least, saying that it's become much, much worse. Um, so I, that's at least a, a silver lining. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Uh, so at this point, let's introduce our very special guest today. And I'm going to turn that over to you, Kevin, to get the conversation going. Well, Tom, I, you and I have done this call for a long time, but I'm going to award this right now for best name uh, that we've ever had for a guest. So Ramona Aurora, we, we're so thrilled to have you here today. She was telling me just a few minutes ago, her last name is the same spelled for forwards and backwards, which I think is really cool. Uh, but what's even more cool is that she's the VP of Global Talent Development at Dell. Ramona, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Um, you uh, you work in a, a fantastic organization. Um, we were just talking about the uh, Chief Learning and Talent Officer Board, and, and actually the person who's been running that board for us for the last decade is the former CLO at Dell. Uh, used to report into Michael, actually, John Kone. Um, and so it's a company we've worked with for many, many years. Um, I know you've been there for a while, so tell us a little bit about your career journey and, and then uh, just what your role entails at Dell today. Absolutely. So lifelong learner here. I started my career actually as a high school teacher and a Division I basketball coach. And so I feel like the learning, the coaching has always been in my, just it's been in my life, right? Um, people sometimes ask me, uh, you know, is it harder to teach sales? directors or, or students. And I say 16 year old boys after lunch is always the hardest thing, hardest <laughs> audience to meet. So um, 
But that's really where the roots are, I would say, in my journey towards the role that I have today, which I think is probably the best job at Dell. A little biased, but I certainly have a lot of fun and excitement in this role, especially during these times. Um, but started my, my work really in high school teaching and then became really curious around the, kind of the cognitive decision making skills of young people moving further into college about career related to the economy and related to things that are happening around them. And so I took that to graduate school and uh, postgraduate school had an opportunity to, to consult with a lot of small island nations and countries around the world on human capital trends really around focusing on how to harness and the power of, of, of their you know, great talent and how to retain that talent. So for example, if you're in a small island nation, you typically lose that great talent to schools and then to economies that are, that are outside of that, that community. And so uh, really working with governments there, love that work so much that went and did some more consulting, but really missed the classroom. And so when I moved to Texas about 10 years ago, I had a great opportunity to go work as an executive coach um, at the University of Texas and, and, and do some teaching there. But Dell is just up the road. And as you said, Kevin, a very dynamic organization, um, you know, under Michael's leadership and our executive crew, really just always pushing the needle. And when I thought about the innovation and just how the world was moving towards learning, had a great opportunity to come here. I uh, got a chance to meet those sales directors in the classroom um, and really then start to move into prioritizing leadership development. And so I spent about four years at Dell building the leadership development pipeline learning experience from the ground up with a new team. Um, and then most recently got a chance to move into this role where we're really trying to push the, the, the needle on modernizing learning. And of course, as many of you on this call are experiencing right now, it's the technology, the environment is changing so fast. And that's, that's what you know brings me up in the morning with a smile on my face because I know that I have the right team and the right environment to go and do that. Well, boy, I love your background, Ramona. It's a, a, a fantastic one for the role that you're in today. I think it's also somewhat unusual um, compared to most people that we meet who head up corporate learning, you know, in such a large organization. Now, I know we just brought up this slide, which I'm sure you're going to want to uh, talk to a bit just about the structure uh, overall. But I'd also love to just hear a little bit about how things have changed. We talked about how culture has changed over the last couple of years during the pandemic. I'd love to hear how L&D has changed for you at Dell during that time period as well. Absolutely. So when I came in at Dell, some of you might know the story of the largest technology integration uh, uh, you know, ever, right? Which was between EMC and Dell Technologies back in 2016, 2017. I joined Dell in 2017. And so when you think about that, you think about very different philosophies at play, different practices at play on how you go and reach um, all team members, executives, leaders across the company with learning initiatives. How do you develop your talent? Um, and how do you do that at scale? So I would say that traditionally, as most companies are, we were a let's get into the classroom and go teach. And right when I came, there was we're doing some kind of analysis around look, you know, how many learners are we reaching, right? How do we how do we get to the folks? Are we teaching the right things? Is it actually making that, you know, that big black hole in L&D, right, which is like, how do we, you know, assess the impact of our work, right? Are people actually creating behavior changes and implementing what they learn in the classroom back into work? And we realized that we had to, we wanted to try something different. And so we looked at two things. One, how do we scale learning um, using an LXP? Now, back then, if you remember even just five years ago, LXPs were fairly new, right? You had kind of the big players like Pathgather, Degreed, EdCast. Um, you didn't, it was it's fairly new, but we also had experience in something called YouTube, right? Do y'all remember YouTube, right? Most people were like sitting there with YouTube watching TED, TED Talks and, you know, Googling and YouTube and everything, right? And we realized that there was probably some intersection there where we could find a way to scale some learning, building some kind of internal environment where people could access learning anytime, anywhere, and we could have user-generated uh, learners learning as well. And that we weren't always the experts on things, right? How do you, you know, expert engineers can teach aspects of their work strategy, for example, product build much better than potentially the, the instructor themselves. Why aren't they teaching that to their peers and to other people who are curious? We wanted to scale that. At the same time, we wanted to look at um, the leadership journey, right? How do we actually start to build and really focus on leadership capabilities, knowing how vital leaders are to the health of an organization? Um, and so you see the structure that we have today is, is pretty much that there's most of it, I think the, the bones of it really started about five years, five years ago when we transformed learning. And what we did first is understand the learner. And so we went really deep into research. I know, Tom, you're going to love this, right? We went into like real qualitative and quantitative research, understanding the persona of our learners. We took a page out of what marketers do all the time to think about what's the customer journey? What's the learner journey that we want to create? And I think 
I'll tell you, in my 26 years of being in this industry, I don't think we've necessarily always thought about the persona of the learner. We think about the content and we think about the role and we try to match those things together. And so we, you know, where are they situated? What do they do in the morning? What's their, you know, what's their daily routine like? When do they have problems? How do they want to access learning? These are the questions we ask. And so you'll see even just on the slide and kind of the overview of how my org is structured, we, we have kind of persona based practice areas, right? So if you think about professional development, that's learning for everybody. What does everybody at Dell Technologies need to succeed? There is some soft skills, but we've identified even some technical skills, things like AI and ML, things like data science, customer experience as a service. These are some of fundamental technical skills that we know that at Dell Technologies, you have to have some level of understanding. And for some other roles, you have to be an expert in that field. Um, so we really kind of focus on thinking about what are the personas in that field. Then we have leadership development, right? Are you an aspiring leader? Are you a new leader? Are you an experienced leader? Are you a manager? Are you a director? Are you sitting with strategy? Are you looking at tactical? Are you on the floor in a plant? What are those experiences? What do you need to be fantastic at your role? And then of course, executive readiness in terms of transitions, top talent, of course, and you know, the, the, that upperly scalable population, and then our executives as well. So we have this one team, I have this one team, I have a team under each of one of those personas that have become SMEs to understand the persona itself. And then they go and they start to create learning experiences with the persona in mind. And then I have the second half of my team, which that's where the changes happen, Kevin. We didn't have a go-to-market team two years ago. Um, and that's when we started to realize, well, we, we just took a page out of marketing and did all this customer zone work, but have we thought about how we go to market? And that's where, listen, I'm not an HR business partner by trade. Um, and, and, you know, I, I sit in the HR organization within Dell. But I would say that one of the things that we forget to do is we have this attitude sometimes, which is, if I build it, they will come. Right. And we realize that they don't always come, right? Um, and it's because it's not always compliance. And so um, I'm married to a, to a marketer. And sometimes I listen to these calls. And I've learned so much from the osmosis of that environment, but also have taken some time to learn myself around essential go to market, right? What, what is, what are, what are, what's multi-channel look, uh, marketing look like? Um, what does consumer or customer's persona based marketing look like? And so we've really have a go to market team that really started about 18 to 20, about 18 to 20 months ago. We built an, a go to market team within our org. Learning technology, I laugh a little bit. When I was in teacher's college more than 25 years ago, I took a class called educational technology. Kevin, you're going to laugh. I mean, we were learning how to, well, you, you remember this, right? We were learning how to, how to, how to write on, a, on an acetate with colored right. markers. Right, um, how to write do posters and whatnot, right? But the technology keeps changing. We realize that you know it wasn't just PowerPoint, it wasn't just the articulate the storyline. Um, we had when we're assessing at Dell around are we going to build something in house? Are we going to borrow or license something? Are we going to buy something? You have to still have the, the 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 tools to go and make those decisions. And so we have a learning technology team that's been around for a while, but I would say it's grown with more expertise around LXPs, LRSs, different kinds of LMS. Uh, tools for creation tools, design tools, simulation tools, and whatnot, and be able to be frankly honest, be able to speak the same language with half the vendors that are out there, right? You, you go to a conference and you're like navigating conversations about integrations. I mean, I've learned more about IT in the last, you know, two years since COVID than I ever imagined I'd have to learn about IT integrations um, prior to COVID. So that's where you have to have a team. Um, and then, of course, you think about the delivery team. We still have facilitators that are with our people facilitating live experiences. And then, of course, the good old age old uh, analytics team, right, that has to really start digging into the, the impact. All of that team produces what I call kind of the ecosystem of outcomes, right? And um, you'll see here on the slide, I don't need to mention it, but you'll see there's a kind of a, a lot of our, pro we think about, once again, taking some pages out of marketing, right? We look at it as product lines, right? We have Dell University, and under Dell University, we have a lot of different product lines. We have a marketplace that just started. That's a different environment. We didn't have a learning marketplace, but we learned from our customer experience that people like choice. They like to go into the store. They like to buy their own things. We learned that if I go and assign you an activation code for a learning platform, you're actually more likely to use it if you go and pay for it yourself. And when I say pay for yourself, like you use the corporate card and you go pay the, the, the user fee. For some reason, that transaction between choosing to go and buy a license yourself changes the usership. So we're still testing that out, but we've learned a lot just from, you know, kind of early, early testing. I love that though. I, I think that's uh, a learning that a lot of companies probably could take away. Um, you know, a lot of times 
I hear learning professionals saying how much they struggle with usage and just, you know, just trying to get uptake of, of different content that they've put out there. But I, I love that whole concept of they're going to use it if they, you know, theoretically pay for it. Right. I mean, you know, you think about benefits, for example, you know, when I was working with some of the vendors and looking at pricing models for them, we realized that it's actually very similar to benefits. You know, sometimes companies say every employee gets a hundred bucks and you can decide to, to purchase my masterclass or headspace or a gym pass of some sort. And what happens is because you've made that choice and you use your hundred bucks the way you want to, the usership goes up. And we realize, why aren't we doing that for a learning, right? I've got Pluralsight and Udemy and Masterclass, all these like things in my ecosystem. Of course I have fundamentals, right? LinkedIn Learning is our fundamental kind of content library, right? But, and I have in the, you know, the in-house stuff that we create. And I definitely derive that. I use active marketing campaigns, targeted campaigns to drive that. But the other thing is I want people to have some choice, right? Do you learn better with, you know, expert, you know, kind of classroom style learning? Do you, do you want to read more? Do you, you want to do some more reading? Do you want videos? People have to make those choices. And then, then the usership actually does drive. We, we've been testing out for the last year or so, and we're starting to see some movement. So if you have me back in a couple of years, I'll tell you if it's really working. <laughs> Very good. Uh, Ramona, you, uh, we can come back to this slide, certainly, but you touched on the learning technology and you've been dropping some of the names that you use at Dell. So I wanted to bring up this slide just to give everyone a, a broad sense of the, the very, I, I would say, expansive ecosystem of partners and vendors that you use at Dell. Um, speak a little bit to anything you want to highlight here. Right. So um, I think one of the things that you'll see that there is, you'll see this, I've kind of put down what we're using right now, but you'll see, I think one of the philosophies that I have is that, you know, we, we have to kind of, we have to make decisions, right? Tough decisions. And so I don't like to introduce too many things into the ecosystem because I feel like it confuses the learner. But at the same time, I'm also the first one, we, we call it, I call it ugly baby goggles, right? And I'm the first one to put them on. I actually gave blue glasses to everybody in my team. I said, these are our ugly baby goggles at Dell, which is we make decisions with the data that we have at the time right? There's some questions that are unanswered. We put it in the ecosystem, but we have to be careful that we don't just let it sit there and not to continue to do research on it and, and figure out if it's the right decision for the organization and the health of our learners. And so at the same time, while we're doing that, we have to be testing and evaluating what we currently choose, but we also have to have some things on the, you know, in motion, what I call kind of the exploration, the, the, um, the pilot phase, right? And so you'll see that we have things that are primary in use right now, but I would say at Dell Technologies, because of the innovation and because we know that the technology is changing, we know that the, the reality of work and learning is changing, the needs of our learners are changing, that we have to be constantly exploring the, and scanning the environment. Um, and so, you know, yeah, we have something that's out there now. It takes, a, you know, three to five years to really make sure that the integration's working and that, you know, the usership goes up and you test it out. But at the same time, you always want to have something in your back pocket and you want to not be afraid to say, might have made a mistake, have to fix something, right? And that's why we have the blue baby goggles. Um, but that's where the environment is. You, you, one of the things I'll say that if you look at content and even the LXD environment, those the, like I had trouble fitting a lot of those images or like the, you know, the, the logos and the boxes because it's constantly changing. Um, and if you know, I remember going to ATD before um, before COVID, and uh, I think we were in San Diego was one of the last ones I I attended, and I was really like scanning those aisles, and most of the things I was looking at were live experiences. Um, and now I imagine going to, I'm going to DevLearn in, in October, and uh, I know that that's not going to be looking, I'm not looking for live experience, I'm not looking to buy like the Swedish, you know, wooden blocks that I bought from ATA San Diego, I'm looking to buy something else. So um, th that's where it becomes a really dynamic environment. But one of the things, I mean, you have to look at also, the, you know, the macro economy is saying that we have to be a little bit careful about budget from a strategy perspective and learning. Um, and so then you have to start thinking about how you're going to build in-house. And so you'll see that there, there's, we're starting to populate and test out a lot of things in our even in-house build tools. Um, things like iSpring um, and, you know, VoiceOver, like Well Said and whatnot. Those are things that were never in our ecosystem even probably like 10 months ago. We did get one question, Ramona. Are you still doing live learning <laughs> and classroom-based learning? Do you, do, how much is, does that make up your, your total offering? Yeah, it creeps in sometimes. I would say that um, it's very minimal. It's probably less than 10%. We have certain sites. We're a global organization. We've got delivery around the world. And there are certain sites, um, and I would say even culturally, where they want to be in the building, right? We've opened up, I mean, I live in Austin, Texas. The the, the main campus is in Round Rock. Uh, you know, it's not like I'm going in and I'm, bump, you know, bumping elbows with people and fighting, trying to get through the front door, right? It's a little bit more sparse. People are liking to work from home. Dell was 
actually a 65% remote work environment before COVID, right? So we always had that hybrid option, right? Do you want to go in a classroom or do you want to stay home? But we have a couple of places where people are going. And typically, in terms of prioritization, it's been with top talent programs, right? Looking at kind of the most senior folks, getting them together, sitting there with executives in-house, building those relationships. Um, but for the most part, we've gone completely hybrid. Um, all of my leadership development programs that we offer from the Center of Excellence are done remotely. Um, we haven't gone into the building yet for that. We still have it in our, you know, in our kind of back minds of when the need is going to be. But I would say the appetite um, and the flexibility that that um, online learning has um, seems to be working. Most of the on-site experiences are reserved for teams and team building. Um, and for, for teams that are very much located in one site that feel very comfortable kind of going to building together. But we've learned just from a global environment that not everybody's not at, in the same comfort zone yet. Um, but I'll say I'll share that, you know, one of the things we're looking at is and we're, we're, we're learning even from some of our university partners who've tried this during COVID. Um, you know, I certainly learned a lot about hybrid learning with my, you know, for my second grader. And I don't know <laughs> if he liked that very much. <laughs> so I don't know if I like that very much. But, you know, we're exploring things like does do holograms make sense in this environment? Um, do multi cohort learning make sense where you have multi sites um, with one instructor still? Um, does that does that, you know, uh, change the environment and, and allow those who want to be on site. You know, I think hybrid learning for the most part, when we tried it during COVID, it was like some people are in a classroom, some people are online, we're going to have a camera and we're going to use Zoom. Um, and that's not really necessarily what we're, I think, we're heading. So long answer to a qu easy question, are we on site, Kevin? But um, the question is, it's a little more complex than that, I think, for us at Dell. I'm glad you mentioned your your history with being more of a remote and hybrid company than than most, even before the pandemic. Um, I've personally been someone who worked remotely and in, in hybrid for about 20 years now across four different companies. And I used to even give talks on best practices for virtual leadership and things like that at a lot of conferences well before COVID came along. And I would always cite Dell as one of the sort of pioneers and leaders in this space for having that higher percentage who uh, were seeing the benefits of remote and, and hybrid, you know, let's say over 50% of, of your workforce. Um, definitely one of one of the few that were like that prior to 2020. So thanks for giving us that context. And I also want to thank Suzanne for responding to the question that came in the chat. Uh, others on the call should feel free Chime in in the chat. I, I think it would be helpful for others on the call. If you're not a company like Dell that has this long history of hybrid and remote work, um, what what percentage of of classroom uh, uh, you know instructor led is is done virtually versus in person? I think others on the call would appreciate hearing from some different types of organizations. Um, but for now, with you, Ramona, let's let's move on and, and dive into some of the other interesting things that you've been leading. Well, I'll just say one thing before we move on, Tom, that while we were 65% remote, all of our training was primarily 85% in classrooms. So that's where so that the is a big switch, shift. So, so I'm sure that that is a shift, right? And a part of it was yeah. like, I mean, I work remotely, but I want to go in the classroom. I want to see people live. Um, and so that, you know, I think for many of you who are like, we were always in a, in a building. We never did remote learning. We didn't, we didn't do very much remote learning, to be honest. We did most of our stuff was insight in a classroom, um, especially our leadership development touch points. And that's where we've had to shift over the last couple of years. Um, so Tom, where, where do you want to go next? There's so many questions I have for Ramona. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one I'd like to hit on, um, when we had uh, the prep conversation, Ramona, um, you gave me sort of three key aspects that you focus on, and I, and I jotted them down at the time, um, that you want your learning experiences to be, and these were your words, Netflix bingeable, edutainment, and measurable. Um, so if you could touch on each of those, because I, I, that first one is unique, I think. I've never heard Netflix <laughs> bingeable, at least in this context. Um, but uh, I think the three of them together are pretty powerful. And I'll just share from a for global audience, for those of you who don't know what Netflix is, it's a, it's like an online platform where you can watch movies and TV shows uh, at your leisure. Uh, you know, definitely not waiting for the next episode. You can watch an entire series or a season, you know, <laughs> overnight. Um, but this is where, once again, right, thinking about how am, even for me, how am I consuming knowledge and information? How am I growing a skill? I remember some of these like recent TikTok commercials, right? I don't think anybody's seen them, but you know, it, it's like somebody's learning how to, I don't know, like, you know, flip an egg in a fry pan and it's like, oh, I, I you know, TikTok taught me how to do it. And, I, you know, at first I thought it was maybe very generationally isolated. I was like, no, this is, this is for Gen Z or this is for my kids. Like, no, you know, the, but I started to, you know, talk to more colleagues um, and even friends, and I realized that so many of us are liking this like right size, bite size learning piece, right? And 
And so thinking about that, I thought, well, you know, why is it that people like to go and binge watch now on Netflix, right? What, what is this, you know, they, they want the information, they want the experience now, and they, it needs to kind of leave them wanting more. And so when we think about usership, right, I talked about a lot of times we have user platforms or, or content platforms, and we don't drive the usership. I think we have to like put our ugly baby goggles on and remind ourselves like, why is it that it's not as engaging? Are we, do we not know our learner enough? Um, you know, or do we have a hook, right? Um, and so, I, you know, we, we came up with this idea of where it's like, no, all our learning is gonna be Netflix bingeable as much as we can make it, right? There's some things that are compliance-based or very technical where, you know, hopefully it's Netflix bingeable for the person who needs it because they need to go, need that knowledge and that information, that skill set to go do their job. So that's the driver, right? That's the Netflix for them. Um, but for the most part, when you're looking at soft skills and leadership development, for example, or top talent or executive readiness, onboarding for example this is like where you get to bring people into your organization and really get them to feel of the culture of the organization it needs to have a hook it needs to keep wanting them to come back and get more and so every experience we use an lxd approach right this kind of human-centered learning experience design approach to design with the experience has to want me to come back for more or if not for the same topic i'm going to want to come back to the center and take more learning on whatever topic it is um, a second one, of course, is um, it's got to be edutainment, right? So this is not a this is something that I learned and that I've been practicing since I was a high school teacher, you know, 20 years ago, which was around the idea of it, we, you know, it's limited time. When you work in a workplace, you're very busy. You've got competing things, and when you're working remotely, you all know now that you're not necessarily in a room where you can ask people to put their cell phones in their bags and, you know, leave the phone the ringers off. I mean, you've got some, you know, there was a time where we had kids and puppies and. We had just a lot of a lot of distractions. We've got IMs happening on our on our chat windows. We've got emails, and it's it's really hard to turn all of that off sometimes, right? right? And so, but but if we can create an environment where I'm entertained a little bit, and when you think about entertainment, there's something about entertainment that I would say triggers some an emotional response, right? And I think this is a piece of where like I mean I think about early learning, and I was like no 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 my early learning was based on the objective of getting you to know this information is very didactic and is very I call it the banking model of, of learning. I have information I got to deposit it into you. I never talked about the feelings. And so the edutainment part, which was like how do we evoke emotion or a feeling that can then trigger a memory, which then in our hope is that it acts a little bit of a behavioral science method of then if I have it in my memory and embedded. And I have a reaction to it when I'm on the job and when the situation occurs, I'm able to trigger and pull forward the knowledge I got or the experience I got in the learning into the workplace more easily. And so this idea of edutainment, which is like, it's gotta be entertaining, but entertainment means we're trying to build experiences that kind of pull into the emotion. And that can happen with technical training. We're seeing that in our customer experience, our MI, AI training, our data science training, where we're starting to kind of get people into experiences that are super fascinating that then trigger an emotion, resonates, it sits there, it, it serves, a, it builds a memory for them, and the memory can be triggered later on. Um, and then the final thing is measurable, right? At the end of the day, right, it, learning with technology is actually requires a lot of investment. Every year I have to go in and be like, ah, I need more investment. And, I, and you know, some of you have been around for a long time, we haven't necessarily gotten all the investment, right? It was like your investment is like PowerPoint slides and the instructor is going to go and teach it. Um, and if you want to continue to go build Netflix bingeable and edutainment, you need some investment. And so it has to show a return on investment. It has to show that it's making a change. And so um, when you have, when you deploy an LXD uh, method to your design process, you think about the experience and then you start to think about how am I building a measurable experience, right? Um, and that's the, the three kind of, I would say, codes, right? Or uh, fundamentals of any experience we're trying to design at Dell. And so, Ramona, how are you measuring? You've been very transparent with all the different technologies you're using, so yeah. which is unusual. Thank you for doing yeah. that. But I'd be curious, how, how are you measuring? So I would say one of the ways that we started to measure, I mean, obviously, you've got your, I don't like to call them small sheets, right? But you have your surveys, you have your user experience surveys. That's level one, right? Yeah. Then you go in, we have, we have built in moments where in our continuous learning process where there's touch points, right? So our facilitators come back to, let's say, a cohort, they might do another survey or they bring them into like a, hey, how's it going? It's a quick half an hour call. And we kind of start to check in and, and, and measure qualitatively in that interview process or that conversation process about what are the questions? What are they deploying? And that's actually helping us figure out we're seeing patterns in that. Wow, they sat in a three day program for, for aspiring leaders and we're finding that, the, you know, everybody's kind of pointing to basic things on just productivity tools. Okay, well, that's only a segment of our, of our program 
why are they struggling with that? Well, what can we either deploy? What tools can we give them later on in that learning journey? Or, you know, what is it about the way we design that learning experience where it's sticking with? Or like, is our persona in that environment saying that that's their number one challenge that they, we need to go solve for is productivity? I don't know. But just right. those that kind of the aftermath. But then, you know, that's not necessarily scalable. Right? I can't have my delivery team going out and interviewing every learner. And so most recently, we started to last year introduce chatbots. Um, and chatbot technology is really interesting, right? Because what we did is we added a little bit of a spin. We were working with a vendor where they had kind of avatar type of images. Um, it was very text heavy. And once again, right, remember my principle around edutainment, emotion. I was like, people connect to people. And one of the ways I know I do that is through film. And so we started to create some, some film-like videos um, that actually introduced what a coach might look like. But it would be deployed through um, through our Teams interface, right? Our kind of our messaging interface at Dell, and then we introduce idea of like a chat bot that would just you know ping learners, uh, you know, five days, fifteen days, twenty days after learning, and start to measure, you know, hey, you said that before you left the end of the class that you were going to focus on these three things. How's it going? What are oh. you struggling with? And based on their responses using the chat bot, and the, you know, we can with the ML, we can then push additional learning, we can remind them of things, we can send them, you know, a PDF of like a, of a slide that they had in class and kind of jolt that learning again. Now, the analytics behind that is fascinating, because once again, we can start to see what's in action, where's the gaps that they're forgetting or they need help on, and also start to look at the timing, how long is that learning reten uh, the learning retention happen, and then when are they implementing? Um, what's the commitment to the experience to be putting into action? So I would say chatbots are, are become, I mean, we're, we're, we're expanding that into more of our programming. Um, the learner seems to have an appetite for it. Um, and that's becoming really robust. Now, what that means is I need to go build some more, you know, some, some programming language and some chatbot capabilities in my team. Um, but that's where we're looking at learning and measurement as well. And the final piece is we're actually partnered with our talent analytics team. And we're really digging into, we have a learning record store, right? We have that. Yeah. But when we did an analysis of where data sets it, it's beyond all the integrations we already did with our learning record store. It sits in so many different places. And so working closely with our talent analytics team and working with some data scientists, that's where you start to see where I don't know if I really employed a data scientist in learning for the last like 20 years, but I sure as heck am looking for talent in that space now. And we have a couple of people on the talent side who's come over to our team to support that and really digging into the, the, the kind of the, the you know, our data lake, for example, and trying to think about how do we get all our data um, you know, I don't know if anybody has an answer to this, right? But we we typically feed, we have Workday as, um, you know, our kind of our, our main HR platform. And then we have Saba as our main LMS. Well, our, our Workday, our, sorry, Saba will pull information from, from, Saba will pull information from Workday about the learner, right? Badge number, et cetera, whatnot. But we haven't necessarily looked at the reverse, right? Does Workday pull in data from Saba? And we're looking at, of course, the skills that are captured in your learning record, of course, but then also the persona pieces are really important, right? Um, and so there's some integrations and I think new relationships that are forming between our analytics team that sits in HR, uh, you know, a lot of our data science team members looking at HR technology um, and, you know, looking for integrations there and IT is really fascinating. So that's with that, I hope our analytics gets better, but that's some of the ways that we're starting to measure the learning impact for sure. So Ramona, you, you've touched on uh, the chatbots um, and you mentioned machine learning as, as part of the technology that drives that. Um, we actually have another poll. Uh, we were gonna do it a little bit later, but um, Zeta, if you could bring up the second poll here in a moment. I'm curious for others on the call, if they um, are using AI in, in any of their L&D experiences um, in any of the offerings. So simple poll there. And while people are answering that, Ramona, a couple questions for you. Um, is the is your chatbot technology that you were referencing is that from a vendor like a service now or another vendor like that or is it something you developed internally so it's a bit of a hybrid so we have the technology from the vendor but we're actually starting to write our own chatbot right so like do you know writing writing the lines of code you would say right so um it's we're definitely a partnership but i would say when we initially piloted it was 100 percent from the vendor um, you know, we did some customizations, um, but all the uh, content now that we get to push out are, are things that we're pushing out, right, that we're trying to pull out from. Um, so it's a, it's a growing process. Remember, like the yeah. skills on an L&D team are not always keeping up with the technologies, right, yeah. that the vendors have. And that's a struggle that we're, we're you know, we're, we're having to upskill. We're, I mean, it's fantastic. If you want to if you if you're bored and you want to learn a new skill, L&D is just I mean, it's it's growing so quickly that 
you know, for the, I mean, most of us in learning, right, have an appetite for learning. But um, just when you thought you knew it all, um, <laughs> you know, you can add another tool to your toolkit for sure. Are there, are there other areas? So my other question, are there other areas in L&D where you're leveraging um, AI? A, a common one is recommendations in the LXP, um, kind of like Amazon or Netflix recommendations. You took this course, you might be interested in that. Um, but also it's being used in some cases. Um, I know Citibank, um, Cameron Hedrick, the CLO there is, it's very interested in, in, in adaptive learning. So within a mm -hmm. training program, within a self-paced module, um, using AI to help determine where you should go next within that module. So I'm curious if you're using either of those uses of AI or, or something else. Well, we are using that in terms of our build. I would say, but one of the most unique places where we're using AI is actually um, around kind of commu you know communication skills, like cover the entire organization, right? Um, and for the most part, it's been very subjective and it's been difficult sometimes to, to create learning where it's scalable, right? Because if everybody wants somebody to give them feedback and not everybody has a panel of people to give them feedback available to them. So we've actually been working with a vendor where they've used AI technology. So it's, they've been building this for about a decade now, maybe a little over a decade, but they've taken, you know, expert communication coaches and they've built this, this machine, right? This, this AI to figure out, you know, how do we assess communication skills? And currently what we have for a lot of our middle managers that, that have to kind of, you know, influence, you know, up and down and across the organization, um, what we deploy to them and their experiences is where we, we set them up with this, um, with kind of this, they, this AI machine. And what happens is they invite this to their Zoom calls for their team meetings, right? So they, they kind of bring this, this, this machine into, you know, they're kind of the, the, I'd say the, it's not a bot, but they pull it into their Zoom and we turn it on and the AI starts to assess the quality of their, of their team meeting or their presentation or their all hands or, you know, delivering a message or their pre whatever it is, presentation. And within half an hour, they get a report out and it's scored, right, on the AI assessment that's just been deployed. Well, now, it's a couple of things that happens. Dell, we're a very competitive environment, right? <laughs> we like to win. And right. so there's a little bit of a gamification that happens here, but we're using the eye to build some of that also very objective analysis on how well are you engaging with your audience using communication skills? What's your tone? What's your voice? What's your body language? What's the language you're using? Are you using people's names? Right? Are you triggering good responses? What's the engagement level? And we're starting to do that and then taking basic Zoom data on, on engagement and, and showing a leader who says, no, like my team meetings are great. I've got great engagement. I'm doing great. My presentations are fantastic. Everybody's listening. I'm like, well, they're on a Zoom call, but do you really know if they're listening? And then be able to use the data from from the AI with some of the Zoom data has been really interesting in, in that. So that's why we've been using it at Dell. Um, uh, been using it in different programs, but but being able to assess live, you know, as opposed to you know, go record this message and let me go assess how well you recorded the message. That necessarily doesn't kind of give the right impact that we wanted. And so you know, assessing somebody's impact on a team call is really natural for that matter. And so it, I think the uh, the poll here is indicative of what we're seeing out in the industry. People are just really scratching the surface when it comes to using AI in l and I think there's a lot of uh, very interesting applications going forward. So looking forward to that. And then I, I saw that we had some questions around assessments, Ramona, and I mean, I don't even know how you're able to multitask and get into the chat here. <laughs> remarkable uh, <laughs> at, at, at that. But uh, I'm just curious what you're doing for assessments. Somebody asked, are you using a vendor for that? And, you know, how are you handling assessments? Yeah, once again, variety, right? So we have, um, uh, you know, I work very closely with a member of the, our, our analytics and ins insights and assessment team, Dr. Stephanie Murphy. She's an IO psychologist. Um, she actually builds our annual survey, um, kind of our, our EMPS that we deploy at Dell called Tell Dell every year. But her and her team, you know, they're 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 IS psychologists and they they're incredible at building assessments. So we actually do build our own assessments. We built one on, you know, Dell's very culture heavy driven, right? So we want to make sure that our everybody really maps our skills to the culture code at Dell, right? Kind of some of the values and principles that we that we kind of put forward into the environment. And so we have a culture code skills assessment that we built in house. It's been built over the last four to five years. We've been able to then gather all that data, and now the the I would say the the outcome, the output has been great, right? We're still learning that it's interesting. We build these in house assessments, but people really want to have their strengths finder, and they want to have their Hogan, right? So that's where you right. have to understand your your persona, right? So if I if I have a, a high potential um, top talent program with my director audience, they want to use Hogan, and so we use Hogan in that environment. Um, so those are kind of those broad skills assessments. Um, 
But I would say also when we do learning, it's thinking about how do we ask the questions before and after to assess um, the proficiency. Um, give you another example, right? One of the other ways I'm doing assessments is you have proficiency assessments within some of your learning platforms, right? So for example, Pluralsight, for example, and Udemy have a skills assessment they'll do and they'll monitor, kind of assess that. And then as you move through the learner journey, they'll kind of tell you who's moving from proficiency of novice to intermediate to maybe see, to advanced learner. So once again, it's, it's a very dynamic environment. We have in-house capabilities that we can do that. Um, most of my portfolio managers or S SMEs and our personas um, have learned and are building skill and capacity individually around being able to build their own assessments in their learning. It's a skill set, right? It's not just a survey, right? It's a true skill set. We're also leveraging the experts that we have at Dell and also using um, external partners to go do the same. So we've had this uh, screen up for just a few minutes here. Tell us a little bit about your live learning simulations. Yeah, this is fantastic. I mean, it just it's incredible about what you can do with some simple tools, right? So I want to think about like, I've talked about a lot of vendors, right? Vendors also require big dollar spend. Um, and we don't always have that, right? Which is, I have, a, I think, a relatively good sized team um, of designers. I've got about eight, uh, you know, kind of pure uh, technical and instructional designers on my team, which, uh, you know, for a company of 135,000, maybe is actually not enough, right? <laughs> we often feel that way. But my whole team is about 50 people. But um, we have some fantastic designers. And so one of the things that we've been looking at is that, you know, how I many of you have been to a panel discussion, right? And the panel happens and there's some amazing learning. Um, or you've been in a session where there's been a you know one hour lunchtime workshop and you do breakout rooms, learning's great. But how many people can attend them? How many people miss out, right? You can watch the recording, but that's not really dynamic because you can't participate. And so one of the ways that we're starting to, I would, would say scale live learning is by building what we call a live-based learning simulation. So and it's really simple. We're using two tools. We're using Storyline and we're using Zoom. So one of the things that we do is we then say, okay, we design, we design first an instructor-led training experience, right? And we invite engaged learners to attend, right? And we say open call, right? Register, it's happening this time, this place. Um, and, and then, you know, we, we have them engage in the experience. So let's say the topic is, um, let's say the topic is uh, influence and persuasion, for example. We'll have a learning experience around that. While that experience is happening with a live facilitator, we then use the Zoom as a delivery platform but we record every aspect of the live experience. We're recording the main classroom. We're recording the, the, the every breakout room. Um, and we're also, you know, interacting with the learners themselves a little bit about like, you know, where they come from, who they are, et cetera, because people are really curious about that. After that session is done, the live learning experience, we then do the next step, which is then we go carefully through all of that footage that we've captured through Zoom, essentially. And we start to break down the video and the audio files and start to create selected key moments to build a simulated experience and storyline. And so now, you know, you could go and you could listen to the recording that happened at lunchtime, the workshop. But instead of just listening to the recording, now I can have you go into the experience where actually now you can have a comment to say, but you can also go and see how other people responded to the exact same moment where, that you were thinking about or that the same question the facilitator asked, you can go and see how other people responded. You can take notes, for example, it's very dynamic. Um, I think we have a little bit of like a moving image on the next slide, but. But um, this is really, I mean, this is bare bones, simple in-house simulation build, right? There's not a lot of expensive technologies and whatnot. Now, if you want to go further, we're going to start creating some learning communities to help continue that learning from, the, from this live-based uh, experience. So we're going to, of course, deploy the chat bot to measure the impact of the learning experience and, and use some of the um, social tools that we have at Dell to create some learning communities so that people can continue learning together. Um, but you'll see that it's, I mean, the tools alone if you're going to build a simulation, you don't necessarily need all the bells and whistles. I mean, I remember going to a conference a couple of years ago and they were trying to sell me like VR cameras and whatnot to go build a simulation. Right. <laughs> right? And here we have where we've already kind of done our first launch on this. But um, now here we have and we're starting to do a series of these particular experiences on future ready skills, um, which, as you know, all of you know, changes dramatically. But, you know, really are kind of a business imperative for making sure our talents is the right talent and moving in the right direction of development at Dell. Yeah, you've been you've been very generous to a lot of vendors throughout this presentation. They probably don't love this <laughs> because this is a, <laughs> they this don't. Is a yeah. fantastic way to do uh, it's pretty sophisticated things, but you yeah. know, on a shoestring budget. Right. I, I mean, I think that's where you have to make decisions, right? I think um, you know, there's there's often moments where I have to make decisions on are we gonna am I gonna put um, you know, am I gonna invest in my people and my talent, right? And this year we did a lot of investment on 
really our talent development within talent development, right? So we did a lot of work with our delivery team, right? Really teaching them the core skills of virtual learning environments. Tom, you know, you shared some great resources that we I took directly to that team. Um, we, you know, we have actually a dedicated um, learning effectiveness coach, right? That really sits in, I mean, I think she's done over like 45 different like classroom observation, like, you know, virtual classroom observations and coaching our instructors because it's a different skill, it's different muscle. Right, teaching in the classroom is very different from teaching online. We know this even from our teachers who taught our kids, right? It's not the same, right? Um, and so there's that. And then of course our designers had to really start to think about out of the box, how they can leverage the same tools they're using for kind of basic build products to then how do you build a simulation in that? Um, so you have to decide sometimes, you know, there's moments where, you know, we kind of write the check and we go get the vendor. But I, I would say that, you know, if you call the vendors and they're like, were you working with Ramona's team? They'll be like, oh yes, <laughs> you know, because we tend to get in there and we want to customize everything. We're not necessarily the nice, you know, like the easy customer. <laughs> so, but, um, but that's where we have, we, you know, I feel like sometimes in the process of building edutainment, we have edutainment ourselves because um, we're learning with the vendor, but then we're also um, developing ourselves with that experience. I, I want to just jump in and again commend you as Kevin was um, for uh, and, and my take on this is um, a, a lot of sort of the default for a lot of companies is well we can either do instructor led and it's synchronous or we can do a recorded video and it's asynchronous self paced e learning module we build it in captivate or cam you know Camtasia or something else um, and it's either or. But what you've done is you've said, no, we're going to have sort of the benefits of both. We're going to do the synchronous training for those that can attend live. They'll have that benefit. They can ask questions, get live feedback from the from the instructor, work with the producer and so on. They'll have that level of benefit. But that's not always so scalable. You'd have to schedule a bunch of those for all sorts of times around the world. So to then be able to take that uh, and just simply providing the recording, that's not a great experience as a, as a flat recording for people to watch as a, you know, more admittedly more scalable, but self-paced experience. But what you're doing is having people smartly go in, chop up that recording and provide it in a way that does provide more valuable in that more scalable way. So just having the intentionality around that, um, I, you know, you're, you're, you're hitting on all the right buttons, I think. Yeah, there's like, I mean, I, I always kind of think about it from like, there, like, there's like the three S's in my head all the time. I, I mentioned like the Netflix binge build, the measurable, and of course, achievement. But I always think about, there's like these genuine questions that I we always ask ourselves and within my team before we go and build, even when we're building and when we're testing even afterwards. And one is, of course, like, I always call it three S's, right? One is around the style, right? Because you've got so many stylistic options out there. You sometimes have to commit, right? Um, and remember, I mentioned that we want this to be Netflix binge bowls. We don't want to shake our learner up too much where they come to one thing, it's a great experience, and they come to the next thing, they're like, that's not what I, like, I thought I was coming back to another great experience. So you, we want to be a little bit careful and mindful of, like, being some consistency in our brand and our quality, right? But the, the style of the learning has to matter, right? And that's, once again, like, you have to do that, 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 that learner persona mapping is so fundamental these days, right? You just can't, because you can't always read your learner in a classroom you don't always have that instant relationship. I can't figure out the person who's going to be most distracted, who's going to walk out of the room 10 times and answer a phone call. I don't know that when I'm on Zoom. So I have to do that, that research really up front. And then I can figure out the style of learning I want to create. Then I have to think about the scale of it. And Tom, that scaling, right? That answer of like, it goes back to kind of the measurable question, right? So I need to think about like, what are my expectations of where this is going to go and how much I want it to reach? It's, it's great to have, you know, 18 to 25 people in a Zoom call and have an experience there, and that's going to serve a purpose, but when do I need to then go reach thousands of my learners, right? I need to, like, redesign the experience, um, and I know, like, a lot of companies, I think that's where they struggle with. They try to take their in-class experiences and replicate it, right? Your learning objectives can stay the same, but the style and the, the scale of that learning has to change, right? And then the other, the, the final S I think about is in the sink. Then I make the decision on the sinking, right? It, you know, what's this environment? And sometimes when I think about the in-class experience, right, um, and that's where I talk about maybe looking at like multi-site co multi cohorts, right, in the experience, right? So at least some people are together. But um, that's where I, I get the biggest, you know, I used to have a relationship with my facilities teams. I needed doors open for me, right? <laughs> I needed rooms reserved and doors open. And now, you know, as we go to return to site, I've got to have relations with facilities be like, um, so where are the screens are placed, where my projectors are, if you're going to put a camera in there, I need it to be like tracking voice. Like there's a lot of conversations I need to have with my facilities team, because even if I go into a classroom, you have to think about 
sometimes on a top talent program, you're flying people in from around the world. What happens when somebody arrives in town for that learning and they're now quarantined in their hotel room because they tested positive for COVID? That, that's the reality that we faced actually not too long ago when we had an onsite. Well, you have to make sure that that room that you're in now and you want to have kind of the, the, the hybrid learning environment, that that room is equipped to support that learner as well. And where I could, I could deploy one facilitator, I probably need a producer to go mine that chat so that when that learner has questions, it's not like they can't participate actively and on time. So anyhow, so those are some of the things that I'm always asking. It's like, it's like what's the style? What's the scale? What's the, and then I can make some decisions on the sync. Um, love it. expectations. Yeah, I love all three of those. I love you mentioning the important role of the producer as well. Uh, that often at a lot of organizations uh, is sort of an afterthought. Um, wanted to just note for everyone, Kevin uh, had back-to-back -back webinars that he's hosting today, so he needed to, to duck out uh, before we're, we're wrapping here, uh, but he wanted to thank you, Ramona. Um, I had one more question for you, though, uh, since we've got just a couple minutes left. Um, you obviously you said you have about 50 folks on your team. Um, you're a great leader. I think some folks on this call might might be interested in one day joining your team. What what are the kind of things that you look for in an L and D professional? You mentioned earlier uh, these days the uh, more emphasis on analytics and data science. That's a very specialized skill uh, mm -hmm. for only probably a handful of roles on the team. But what sort of qualities would you say you look for overall for for members of your team? Yeah, great question. I mean, I can say the general skills, right? You know, are you agile, right? Because I think um, change agility i mean i think never underestimate the, that 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 ability to be able to adapt to change is so powerful and so incredibly needed in our industry and, and in the work that we do um so i was kind of you know one day we could start with an idea and you know 24 hours later it could shift it could change right just because of the nature of the environment we're in but there's also some things around um you know the it's important in my in my perspective that you have an ability to consume and understand your business so i talked about personas a lot, right? And I talked about investigating the style. I talked about human-centered design. And that means that my entire team of 50 people have to be genuinely curious and have an aptitude to understand the business. And that's where you start to see a bit of fragment fragmentation happen. There was a time and day where L&D professionals used to depend on the SME, right? They would go to the SME, they would collect that information. Now we still definitely have that and we leverage that, 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 um, that, that relationship. But I think you have to have an aptitude to be able to consume and understand the business itself, right? Understand, you know, how does the business make money? What are the change needs? Understanding how to understand how the strategy goes from a strategy on document to then actually in practice. And you have to have a great network. And so I think when I'm looking at building people, you know, building my team, I'm always looking for people who have that kind of insatiable desire to build connections and networks and to learn. From a skills perspective, it's very interesting, right? So my design teams, I would say and one of the things I didn't mention, but like, you know, we we do a lot of film right now um, and we've actually partnered with a film company for a lot of our builds. Right. I talked about film building emotion. So that's kind of where a lot of our investment is like we'll write the scripting, but we go and we hired a film company, a local film company in Austin to go, you know, do a casting call and, 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 and film and edit um, for film. Um, but I, you know, and so in that case, I need my L&D professional to be able to, I would say, um, understand the business, but also have an appetite of creativity that I don't, I think we underestimate what that looks like. Um, but it's, it goes beyond that because I think, um, it's kind of like the live learning simulations, right? Sometimes you don't have all the tools. So what can you do with the ones that don't, um, I'll say that one of the applications I get, I mean, I, we have a couple open design roles and facilitator roles. And, um, I think I have one of my learning effectiveness coaches on the line here today. And, when we're fielding, you know, uh, for facilitators, we get a lot of um, applications from from teachers, right, who are maybe thinking about a second career, at, you know, in a different kind of classroom. Um, and I made that same move myself, right, from the classroom to corporate. And I would say that not everything translates, right, um, differently. I, I I told you that the hardest audience I had were 16 year old boys after lunch, right, <laughs> in a, in a, right. So. Uh, I think that we, everybody respects that, you know, you can, the classroom management, you have the expertise, you can speak it from an audience. But I think that it relates back to also understanding the business and understanding some core principles around adult learning. So some essential pieces of like, I want people to be almost behavioral scientists when they come to my team, whether you're a designer mm -hmm. or a facilitator. So those are some of the things, the qualities that I'm looking mm -hmm. for, people that, that can kind of operate in that space. And then the technical skills that falls with the, the role, it depends on what role you're, of course, applying. What role you're in, yeah. 
Well, very good, Ramona. Well, we're, we're at the end of our hour. It's been an outstanding conversation. You're getting lots of thanks and kudos uh, from folks in the chat, including some that have Thank already you. had to drop off. Um, you mentioned some openings on your team. I wouldn't be surprised if their skills match up. Some of the folks on the call today might be applying, so you might get a few additional applications to add to the the long list that you've no doubt already get. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining today. Um, I've had this slide up uh, our conference in March, so keep that in mind. Um, look forward to having you all again on future I4CP calls. And once again, Ramona, great conversation. Great having you as a guest today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tom. Appreciate it. Thank you, Kevin, too. Bye, all.